The beef business is big in Missouri. It's the most common enterprise on Missouri farms with around 2 million cows on 60,000 farms. We'll take a look at some modern methods to ensure Missouri stays at the top of the industry, next on Show Me Ag. Welcome to Show Me Egg. I'm your host, Kyle Vickers. Thanks for joining us. Missouri has a long history in the beef business. On a trip through rural Missouri, a traveler will see herds of cows grazing on hillsides and prairies where lush grass and relatively mild winters make the state an ideal location for raising calves. And efforts are continuing to make sure that we also have high quality cattle so that consumers have confidence in the quality of the beef they eat, but also in the safety and nutrition of that steak or burger that they love. We have with us Chuck Massingill from California, Missouri, the immediate past president of the Missouri Cattlemen's Association, a farmer and a veterinarian as well. Chuck, thanks for being with us. We appreciate you coming. Uh, you're a cattleman yourself. You've been in the industry, uh, a veterinarian at Osceola, Missouri, and then yes, in uh, public practice with the Missouri Department of Agriculture. Yes, and got into the beef industry and got involved. Uh, how's the beef industry shaping up? Is it relatively healthy? We are doing excellent. We have really recovered from the drought. Uh, our herd size is building. We just got a report out today from USDA that we have moved back into second place in the beef cow number state. We're, we're second only to Texas, and they have considerably more land, so we're getting closer. Uh, we have an extremely strong market. Our production is down because we've had land moved from, some of our land has moved from pasture and hay use into crops. And the uh, drought also took several cattle off of the land because we just didn't have the resources to support the animals. But uh, we have an extremely vibrant, uh, growing, uh, not only industry, but our, our involvement in our communities. Uh, our cattlemen are feeling good, they're doing well, and, and that makes them great citizens. We've kind of got a tendency to spend any money that we get, don't we? <laughs> That's how we do it. That's <laughs> what we work for. <laughs> we... I know, uh, I think at one time I read that this area through West Central Missouri is the highest concentration of cows and calves of anywhere in the country. And, and I want to emphasize to the, to the uh, viewers that we're really talking about that portion of the industry. The feedlot industry is kind of somewhere else, isn't it? It is. It's much cheaper to move the cattle to where the feed can be supplied than it is to move feed repeatedly to the cattle. We have excellent uh, cow-calf uh, productivity in Missouri. We have a lot of land that suffices really well for grass production but it would not make feedlots or it would not be good for uh, a more concentrated population of animals. We do really well. Missouri has capitalized on uh, rotational uh, management intensive grazing. That's increased our productivity and um, it's given us the opportunity to make better use of the land we do have. We use marginal land typically for cattle. It makes great grass, grass makes great beef, uh, and it makes a great cow-calf production, but it's not feedlot country really. Well, that's interesting. You know, we, I, I think in the past we've had kind of a history that maybe Missouri calves weren't favored in that feedlot industry that uh -huh. kind of looked down upon a couple of reasons. Maybe the fescue has something to do, but maybe the breeding programs aren't as good. How's, how's that going? We are doing remarkable. We have learned to manage fescue so it is a benefit for our industry rather than a handicap. In the past, you're absolutely right. The fact that calves came from Missouri was reason for depreciation because they had to go through that detoxification when they arrived at their destination, and that was both expensive and dangerous, calves died. Uh, we've learned to manage our fescue, we're doing a much better job. We've also increased uh, the producer's ability to utilize uh, high-end genetics so that we're increasing the quality of our overall cattle herd. I'm glad you brought up those issues because we visited Leeton, Missouri earlier this week where E.T. Herefords has been in the Hereford breeding business since 1981 but their experience in the cattle industry goes back three generations. I grew up about a mile and a half northeast of here, raised with purebred Herefords. Dad ran about 100 cows, no off-farm income, raised five kids, sent all five of us to college. All five have advanced degrees. Um, I graduated from college high, university high, in 1975. I went to CMS, UCM now, 
I got a bachelor's degree in biology with a minor in chemistry, went to vet school, graduated from vet school in 1981, practiced elsewhere for five years, came back, ran my own practice, and in the meantime, started my own cow herd. I had the interest in the Hereford cattle because I was raised with them and uh, started putting together commercial cows to, to use as recepts because I wanted to do embryo transfer and uh, I learned to taught myself to do embryo transfer, cattle embryo transfer, and tried to advance the, the purebred cows from that. I used the commercial cows, which are a Simmental Hereford cross, as recipients for the embryos from the purebred cows. Uh, the purebred cows run right with the commercial cows so that they're not babied. Uh, we sell about 45 to 50 bulls a year, and the bulls that we sell are raised under commercial conditions so that they don't just melt and uh, fade away like animals that have been fed a high grain ration. Uh, their mothers, uh, their grandmothers, their great grandmothers were all raised on fescue in, in west central Missouri just like any commercial producer would raise cattle. Uh, my, my goal as a veterinarian, I had seen so many purebred operations that fed a higher, a higher had a higher nutritional plane than the commercial operations they were selling seed stock to. My goal as a seed stock producer today is to produce animals that will, will go to work in Missouri conditions, in the conditions we have in, in west central Missouri. Uh, try to not do, well we don't do anything that a commercial man wouldn't because we're, we have the same economic restraints that, a, that any commercial man would have. Try to have the cattle gentle enough, try to breed for, for disposition. Um, and its disposition is learned as well as, as genetic. And uh, if an animal is, is wild, why they go somewhere else. We use, of course, artificial insemination. Uh, the purebred breeders today that aren't using artificial insemination are limiting themselves to just the bulls that are standing on their place uh, with bulls that are, that are have semen frozen that you can buy semen on or buy an interest in the bull and have unlimited access to, to their genetics. You can, you can access genetics from all over the world, um, all over the United States, all over North America and all over the world. And those people that are not using AI have, have really limited the gene pool that they have access to. Uh, I try to travel and see cattle around the United States and Canada. Um, to see what I like, what seems to be working, and then try to bring them here and uh, put them on fescue. Of course, we have the endophyte problems in Kentucky with Kentucky 31 in Missouri. Uh, some of the cattle work well here. Some cattle that look great in other areas don't adapt to the heat and humidity that we have in Missouri and the endophyte that we have in the fescue. Uh, I also do embryo transfer. We transfer 40 to, to 60, 70 embryos per year, uh, do the work ourselves, use these commercial cows as, as recipients for the, for the embryo transfer. Basically with embryo transfer, you're taking the cow that you feel is your most productive cow and you're super ovulating that cow so that she produces multiple embryos uh, to the bull of your choice. My grandfather had Hereford cattle uh, starting in, the, in 1910 in central Nebraska. My dad moved to Missouri, central Missouri, west central Missouri, here south of Warrensburg in 1966. I'm third generation. Uh, we have fourth generation involved. Um, I think probably the one thing that we all have to remember with all the technology that we have in front of us, you still have to be a cowman. You still have to be a cattleman to raise cattle and to make the cattle better. Uh, my grandfather probably was a better cattleman than many of these people today that have an idea that they can just strictly use EPDs and make the matings based on numbers. Of course, EPDs give ratios among animals and it gets to be a fad as to who has the highest numbers or the best numbers or the best EPDs. Now, EPDs that are generated by a computer based on ancestry are about 15% accurate. There again, they're about 85% inaccurate. So we still have to be able to see what the animal does here. I can buy 
a bull that was born and raised in Canada that has great EPDs that I think are, are going to really work for me. But unless I, until I use those genetics here in West Central Missouri, we have, have those animals from him standing here in the middle of August with 95 degrees, 75, 80% humidity, uh, eating low quality fescue, highly infected with endophyte, we don't know how those animals are gonna work. So as a multi-generational multi -generational rancher or, or breeder, I think we have to remember that our fathers and our grandfathers were still pretty good cattlemen. And we, we have a lot of technology available to us, um, but we really shouldn't look down our nose at them. They, they did a pretty good job with what was available. I guess the thing that, that maybe that I'm the most proud of is, is just being part of the farming community here in West Central Missouri. Being, uh, I do the vet work at the sale barn at Windsor on, on Wednesdays. You know, I can go down there and I can be part of a group that is dedicated to the same things that I'm interested in, and they're good people. Uh, you know, I've been around, I've spent a lot of time sitting in a classroom. I've spent a lot of time around well-educated people, whether they're DVMs, uh, MDs, PhDs, college professors, but I'll guarantee you there are no smarter people than those that are able to run a successful cattle operation or a successful farm operation in today's world. Uh, those people may not have a college degree, um, but they've got to be pretty darned intelligent and they can't make very many mistakes and stay alive today. As you may have noticed, Tim is not only the owner operator of E.T. Herefords, but also a doctor of veterinary medicine. And his son David represents the fourth generation and is going to school at his father's alma mater follow in his footsteps and become a veterinarian himself. And if you'd like to learn more about E.T. Herefords, you can find them online at etherefords.com. Chuck, this is a, a fairly common situation here in Missouri. A lot of people really working to improve their cow herd. It is e extremely common, as you said. It's become the norm that people are searching out for good genetics. Another thing that has increased the uh, desirability of our cattle on the market is the Beef Quality Assurance Program. That is a beef checkoff funded uh, producer education program it gives us uh, specific uh, tools to use in production, uh, animal management, nutrition, handling, vaccination, all of those things that affect beef quality. Missouri has over 600 certified producers from the BQA program. And excitingly, over 400 of those have occurred in the last two months. Uh, the Beef, uh, Beef Industry Council gave a grant to the Missouri Cattlemen's Association to to carry that education program into our county affiliates. And through that, we've gotten over 400 people certified just in the last few months. What's precipitated that movement towards quality? I mean, we've got, we've got good pricing and, and it'd be easy to, to relax and say, hey, we're doing great. Consumer demand, and as our cattle numbers have decreased, the price of the product has increased. And uh, so the competition from other animal protein sources has increased. And we need to be able to assure our customers, our consumers, that we're producing a safe, wholesome product to put on the table. On my table, I buy my beef at the grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we're facing uh, really high prices, record prices for, for cattle, and that's because there's been some problems. You mentioned earlier drought in Missouri that's really uh, impacted a lot of folks. Uh, there's some real challenges out there, aren't there? There really are. We've had to do uh, more with less is the typical, I guess, response. We've lost some of our land into crop production, so we've taken away some opportunity for beef production. We've also had the drought, which forced reduction in a lot of people's herds. Um, and so we've adapted to that, and now we're coming back. Uh, we did see a big benefit from the management intensive rotational grazing that University of Missouri has been able to present to our producers for several years now and, and helped us retain some herds that we might have lost. There, there's so many things that go into a successful beef operation from the management of the grass to the management of the cattle health and so on and so forth. It seems like to me as far as quality, there's things like uh, the burns we're talking about here is, is improving your genetic quality so that you have better animals on the farm and then it kind of goes back to the consumer. Let's talk about the beef quality on the farm. Are, are our cattle well accepted in feedlots and, and other places? Are they in demand? Yes, they are in very high demand. Our cattle do not get discounted in the past because of difference in management techniques and the, the lack of, in, I'm gonna say, uh, opportunity to meet the market demands from Missouri producers. 
our calves used to be more of a, a general mid or lower level commodity and now they've become a really high end product. They're, they're in demand, our genetics are excellent in Missouri, the produ production is made by producers that are uh, really dedicated and committed to what they're doing. It's, uh, there, are, there have been times when the cattle were sort of a furry savings account that we might cash in on a need occasion, <laughs> but cattle production in Missouri has become an extremely professional procedure and, and our producers are really, really good at, at what they do. Well, obviously the, what uh, Mr. Byrne was talking about there, you, there's so many technical aspects to it. It's not just a matter of getting a bull and a cow in the same pasture and, and uh, like you say, cashing a check the next year. Exactly. We've learned to take advantage of those genetic traits, traits that he described in the EPDs, the birthing ease, the uh, milking ability and those things. And uh, Dr. Patterson at the University of Missouri some time ago started the Show Me Select Heifer Program. Mm -hmm. That was a way to go through and select the best of the best of the best. And at the end, we have a pregnant female that has surpassed all of her cohorts. Uh, she conceived early. She has uh, predictable birthing ease. We lose, used a bull with extremely low birth weight, so we reduced those risks. Uh, calving is probably the most dangerous time in the life of that animal, and so we've, we've reduced some of that risk, plus we're looking at productivity. Those calves are in big demand in the, re in the uh, replacement female field, and those calves are coming out and heading to the feedlots and people love them. I know in terms of cattle going out to the feedlots, there's several value-added programs where uh, doing uh, certain protocols ahead of selling makes a big difference in terms of selling price. That's another important point you found. Uh, there, were a t there was a time in Missouri history when the calves were weaned on the trailer on the way to the market, and those calves are a high-risk product. If you can imagine a child going to kindergarten with no immunizations, uh, no socialization and none of those things are being cast into that new environment is scary. Uh, we've learned that we can use vaccination programs, parasite control programs, as well as socializations, uh, teaching the cattle to eat out of a bunk, drink out of a water tank, use those preconditioning programs and several different groups have branded that process to their own specific uh, constraints or requirements and uh, that increases the value of those calves remarkably. I know, there, and there's also some programs on the meat side, Certified Angus program being maybe the most famous, well, most well known, but also some other programs that are really focused on the eating quality. Absolutely, uh, Certified Hereford Beef, Certified Angus Beef, uh, Shorthorn, um, Silver Line, uh, there are just a number of, uh, Laura's Lean, there are a number of commodity, uh, define branded products, I guess would be the right way to say it. So the, the consumer has an, a very good idea of what that product will be like when they get it on the table and they get to take a bite. Part of this beef quality assurance is that in, in product, so the consumer has a confidence in the safety and the quality of that product. Tell me about what kinds of things the cattlemen are doing. Absolutely. Uh, part of the beef quality assurance training program is learning about uh, residues, uh, withdrawal periods, either from uh, insecticides or, or uh, antibiotics or uh, medications we use to treat a disease. There's a very specific withdrawal period. <coughs> Excuse me. And the uh, beef industry, beef quality assurance, uh, really forces them to adhere to that, uh, to those standards. And you, so you've been a veterinarian. I know there's some issues about antibiotic use. That's a that's a big issue in the industry, and it is for consumers as well. Talk real briefly about that. The Food and Drug Administration has specified tolerance levels for any, any foreign substance in an animal's body, whether it's antibiotics or anything else. And so we cannot market, there is no clearance market an animal with drug residues, it can't be done. The animals that would be suspect are sampled by Food and Drug Administration or by USDA inspectors. So that again assures our producer, our consumers that we're getting a safe product out to them. So uh, the beef industry seems healthy. Uh, are there some challenges out there that, that you guys see that are kind of threats to the industry? And uh, I'll, I'll mention one of them right off. Uh, my sons bring home girls occasionally that are vegetarians, which uh, really, really doesn't go over well at our house. That's a scary thought. Uh, I'm sure those people are, are dedicated to their persuasion. I just feel sorry for them. Um, no, uh, Probably one of our, our biggest uh, concerns is that groups that are opposed to animal agriculture in general are uh, forming alliances and they would like to put animal agriculture out of business. And so we need for our consumers to understand how we handle our animals, how we raise them, 
how we produce the beef that we put on the table so that they will feel safe and they'll feel secure with our products. Um, certainly uh, veganism or vegetarianism is a, a, a personal thing. We, we know that uh, beef has zip, the zinc, iron, and protein that you're not going to get from other products out there. So, Plus it's delicious. And it is delicious. <laughs> what about the nutritional aspects? You know, I, I'm, I'm at an age and a condition where I, I like to lose weight occasionally. But, and So what about the health and nutrition aspects of beef? Do you feel confident that it's, it's a good product? Yes, it is. One, another great benefit we've gotten from our beef checkoff is the research they've done to define those low fat products. We have, an, and I can't remember the number, a number of uh, cuts available that have less fat than a chicken breast. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not necessarily a high fat meal. There are various components in the beef that uh, various cuts you can use that are very low and very heart friendly. We're certified by the American Heart Association as heart friendly on many of our cuts. I know another question, in fact, I just got this question last weekend, uh, uh, people know I'm a cattle rancher, so they uh, were asking about the contribution to global warming, uh, and that's a big concern for everybody. Uh, so I know there's, there's been some talk that cattle have an impact on that. Can you address that? I'm afraid I don't have any technical information on that. I'm sure the dinosaurs probably produced more <laughs> methane in their life than our cows do, but I'm, I'm not able to answer that technically. Okay. Uh, I know you, you mentioned earlier uh, a promotion. Uh, the industry promotes itself, does, don't they? They, they really do, do a pretty good job of paying for promotion and, and getting that uh, beef it's what for dinner is the, was the campaign for years. Absolutely. Uh, what, what are we doing to promote the industry and to promote beef? We have our beef checkoff. So every time an animal changes hands, we pay $1 into the checkoff. Incidentally, that dollar buying power is now 50% of what it was in 1988 when we started that program. So. Uh, that's something we're going to need to enhance, I think. But that money is used to improve consumer awareness of beef, uh, ways to prepare beef. It also provides research in new cuts like the flat iron steak just came out a few years ago. We discovered that. Um, it also advise, excuse me, educates producers, as I mentioned, on the beef quality assurance. So that's our checkoff. That's how we uh, promote and protect and educate about our product. Uh, that checkoff is used entirely by the Beef Industry Council. None of that goes to the Missouri Cattlemen's. That is for promotion and education and uh, research. And uh, you mentioned that it first passed in 1988. There's an effort underfoot to try to improve that checkoff, those checkoff dollars just a little bit. Tell us how that might work. Okay. We need for all of the beef producers in Missouri to get on the website with the Missouri Department of Agriculture and register so that they can vote in the new referendum that will be coming up. Uh, it will allow us to have a 50 cent per head state checkoff, which stays 100% in Missouri and is refundable on request. Uh, but we need for all of the producers to register and vote because registration for the Beef Industry Council elections that we've had in the past does not make us eligible to vote on that referendum. It's really important to get registered and to vote to uh, raise that. So people will understand this is uh, this is in process in the state legislature that that checkoff would, would come about. Yes. But then at some point people are going to be asked to register to vote that they are a certified beef producer and that they're going to they're going to increase uh, this checkoff uh, on, on the cattle that are sold. Is that, Absolutely. that the way it's going to work? Absolutely. But all that money will stay in Missouri and go to the Missouri Beef Industry Council. Yes, not sir. shared with other states and 100% so on. stays in Missouri. The current checkoff 50 cents stays in Missouri and 50 cents goes to the National Education Program. Um, let's look at a little bit about your association, Missouri Cattle Association. Uh, tell us a little bit about your membership, how all that works. Well, uh, we're a dues uh, supported organization. We're our, our membership dues as well as uh, non-dues revenue such as fundraisers that we have uh, generate the money that operates our association, provides our staffing and pays the bills. Uh, we have county affiliates, or in some cases, multi-counties go together and have an affiliate. Um, I was recruited by my wife in 1986. <laughs> so uh, a farmer pays dues into the state, and then does he also pay dues into the national? The National Cattlemen's Association is a different association, it is, and so it does take a different set of dues. Okay. Let, I want to mention National Cattlemen because uh, recently we just passed a farm bill. I think our last show was a little bit about the farm bill and so on. So we have this massive farm bill, it's argued and argued and argued, but the Cattlemen's Association was one of the only groups that fought it. Can you tell us a little yes. bit about that? Well, we were very happy that the HSUS United Egg Producers, a language on 
animal production did not get into the farm bill. That made us very happy. As well as the uh, conservation uh, title got into the farm bill. Those were very important things. But our big issues that we've carried all the time through National Cattlemen's and through our state is number one is the country of origin labeling is a, a failed experiment. And we have been uh, judged in violation by the World Trade Organization and we're waiting for um, retaliation from Canada and Mexico. Two of our best trading partners are suffering because of that rule. The other was the Gypsy rule, which somehow made it uh, a, a violation if I made a, an arrangement to sell my cattle based on the quality, and it, they brought more than someone else's, then somehow I was violating that person's right by having a more desirable product, and, and that didn't make any sense to us. Let's talk about the country of origin labeling. Uh, <laughs> it, it seems like to me that we'd be proud to label a calf as being from Missouri or from the United States so that consumers would, would know. We are. We are very proud. And we, uh, we in National Cattlemen's and Missouri Cattlemen's, we strongly support any proprietary labeling program you want, such as Laura's Lean or Certified Angus. Any of those that, uh, if someone feels that they have an economic advantage by advertising that, the onerous regulation that's in place now is the label would have to carry where the animal was born, where it was grown, and where it was slaughtered. So that makes a, an, an extended label if a calf is born in Mexico, grows up in Texas, and is slaughtered in Nebraska. Uh, that doesn't seem like it would matter. It certainly has not impacted the consumer's attitude towards the beef. We don't see any change on consumers attitude towards uh, beef that is non-U.S. origin. In Canada, for instance, they ship slaughter-ready cattle into the U.S. And those cattle are merely slaughtered here because they're USDA inspected and certified safe and wholesome, which increases value. And really, there, it sounds like there's a lot of other ways to differentiate in terms of quality and grade and yield. We, we don't have time to get into that, but the USDA is pretty specific about uh, how they grade cattle, and so a consumer could look on the label and find out something about the quality of the beef uh, as, as is. Absolutely, the USDA grading system, both for quality grade and yield grade, whether the amount of muscling and marbling, uh, those are very well defined, they're rec respected worldwide. Very and specific. Very specific, well, very we're gonna, prescriptive. We're gonna run out of time. I was gonna talk a little bit about exports and, and how all that's gonna work, but I'm afraid that's all the time we have for tonight. But I'd like to say thanks again to Chuck uh, for thank coming over, much. Chuck Messingill, uh, for being with us tonight. And thank you to Tim and Dave Byrne at E.T. Herefords for allowing us to visit with them as well. But before we go, we'd also like to thank you, our viewers, for tuning in to Show Me Egg. We hope you'll tune in next time for another look at a topic touching rural Missouri. For everyone here at CAMOS and myself, good night. We're also very interested in what you have to say. So if you have feedback you'd like to share with us, you can email us at showmeag at camos.org or find us on Facebook. 